Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you want to support the podcast, you can at patreon.com slash CanadaX. Every dollar that you give helps keep the podcast going, and we have multiple tiers for you to choose from. Today, I continue my look at the battles of the First World War that Canada participated in. We're going to look at the Battle of mont Sorel. It was on a ridge between Hooge and Zwartelin that Canadian troops would come to mont Sorel, a small hill that rose 98 feet into the air, but provided a clear vantage point over the surrounding area. The force that occupied this spot would have an excellent observation opportunity over Yeeps and the approaching routes. Held by the Allies, it was the only part of the Yeeps Ridge that remained in their hands. Looking at the Canadian positions, Lieutenant General Julian Bing, the commander of the Canadian Corps, saw the Canadian troops were overlooked by German positions and under danger of enemy fire. To remedy this, he assigned Major General Malcolm Mercer to drop a plan to overrun the German positions in a localized attack. While the Canadians began to put together their preparations to launch an attack on the Germans, the Germans were planning their own attack on Mont Sorel with the objective of taking control of the observation positions east of Ypres and keeping the British pinned down there to avoid them transferring to the Somme. For six weeks, the Germans constructed trenches to resemble the Canadian trenches and train their attack. In mid May, aerial photos showed that the German forces were getting ready for an attack. Bombardments began from the Germans but suddenly ceased on the night of June 1st and 2nd. The Canadians did not know why, but little did the troops know the Germans were in no man's land, clearing paths through barbed wire and did not want their artillery interfering with the work. On June 2nd, the German 8th Corps began a bombardment of the Canadian positions again. In this initial attack, 90% of the Canadian Forward Reconnaissance Battalion became casualties. The 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles would be wiped out. Major General Malcolm Mercer and 8th Canadian Brigade Commander Brigadier General Arthur Williams were doing an inspection on the front line when the attack began. Mercer would be hit three times and die the next day, while Williams would be wounded in the face and taken prisoner. Of the 702 soldiers in the regiment who were attacked, 76 would escape unhurt. In the history of the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles, the morning is described as such. It was calm, beautiful, and noticeably quiet morning. Suddenly, without warning, from a heavenly peaceful sky broke a deafening detonation and a cloud of steel, which had no precedent for weight and violence. Every conceivable type of gun, howitzer, and trench moret around Yeeps poured everything it had upon the 3rd Divisional Front. The most extravagant imagination cannot picture such a downpour of destruction. Even those who had tasted the bitterness of modern warfare were staggered by the violence of this onslaught. An NCO with the 42nd Battalion of the Royal Highlanders of Canada would write home stating the following, It seemed as though that part of the line had been transformed into an active volcano so continuous were the flashing of bursting shells. At 1 p.m. that same day, the Germans would detonate four mines near the Canadian trenches. In the history of the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles, it goes on. At 1 o'clock, the bombardment ceased, but only as a signal for the preparation for further violence. The ground quivered and gently heaved, and then came back the roar of the mine. It hurled into the air a large part of the front line and its defenders. Sandbags, wire, machine guns... Bits of corrugated iron and bits of men were slung skyward. After the final eruption, all was quiet, even our own guns. The Germans then attacked with six battalions, with another five battalions in support and six more in reserve. In the detonation of the mines, the Royal Regina Rifles would lose 168 men. By the end of the entire battle, the Royal Regina Rifles would lose 300 men, including three officers being taken prisoner. Resistance on positions held by the 8th Canadian Brigade were minimal, and for hours both the 8th and 3rd Canadian Brigades were without a leader to help coordinate their defence. German forces were able to take Mont Sorel and Hill 61, advancing the line 1,100 metres. In describing the attack, one soldier would say the following, In bright sunlight, the grey-coated figures advanced in four waves, spaced about 75 yards apart. Afterwards, the Canadians spoke of the assured air and the almost leisurely pace of the attackers, who appeared confident that their artillery had blotted out all resistance. 
A German historian would praise the bravery of the Canadians after the war, stating, It is fitting to stress that here too the Canadians did not surrender, but at their guns defended themselves with revolvers to the last man. Another German officer writing in his diary would say of the battle, The attack was completely successful. We are in possession of the important double hill. One is proud of the victories which German and Austrians, Bulgarians and Turks win on all sides. Our enemies, after their continued failures, must soon recognize their helplessness and make an end of it. One trench called the R-Line was described in one report as the following. Everything was shot to pieces and the line is just one shell hole after another with beams sticking up in the air, dugouts completely fallen in, and parts of the trench buried. The attack would be the only time the Canadian guns would fall into the hands of the Germans. Bing then began working on a quickly organized counterattack on June 3rd. Two brigades of the 1st Canadian Division were placed under the control of Brigadier General Hornairn, who had assumed command of the 3rd Canadian Division. The counterattack would happen at 2 a.m. on June 3rd. Due to issues with the distance to travel and difficulties with communications, the attack was moved to 7 a.m., broad daylight. The signal of the attack would be a series of green rockets. Unfortunately, some of these rockets did not burst, resulting in an uneven assault with each unit leaving at different times from their starting position. Advancing over open ground and broad daylight towards the Germans, the attacking battalions suffered heavy casualties and failed to regain any of the lost territory, but did manage to close a 550 meter gap in the line and advance the Canadian front 910 meters from the positions it had retreated to after the German attack. In the book Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry 1914-1919, it is stated that on the counterattack, the PPCLI would lose Lieutenant Colonel Butler and five officers, Major Galt and another 12 officers, including two prisoners of war, and 388 casualties in other ranks. General Douglas Haig and General Herbert Plumer of the British Expeditionary Force both wanted to expel the Germans from their positions. Not wanting to divert troops from the Battle of the Somme preparations, it was decided to push the Germans out using artillery and troops available. Artillery began to bombard the German position, but the Germans suddenly exploded four large mines under the trenches of the 2nd Canadian Division, wiping out the Canadian 28th Battalion. The Canadians still managed to hold their position and prevented the Germans from reaching the support line. Major General Arthur Curry was then ordered to organize a careful attack. Due to the casualties from the previous attacks, Curry organized troops into two brigades. Four 30-minute bombardments were carried out between June 9th and June 12th to make the Germans believe an attack was coming. For 10 hours on June 12th, shells fell on the German positions constantly. The next morning, 45 minutes of shelling would occur on the Germans and assaulting troops would advance through the smoke screen. The Germans were taken by surprise with this tactic and offered little resistance, and the Canadians were able to take 200 prisoners as well. With that, the battle was over. So let's look at some of the men who took part in this battle. Roderick Ogle Bell Irving was a clerk born in Vancouver, the third son of Henry and Mary Ogle. Enlisting at the start of the First World War, he would find himself at the Battle of Mont Sorel, where he was held up with his company by machine gun fire. With his revolver plugged with mud, he bayoneted three machine gunners and was struggling with the fourth when help arrived. He would push on with his men, taking command of both attacking companies of the 16th before the battle ended. For his action in the battle, he would be awarded the Military Cross, and he'd be promoted to command, becoming a temporary major on June 10th, an acting major on July 1st, and a confirmed major on November 15th. Sadly, he would not make it out of the war, dying at Canal du Nord in September of 1918. Hersey Southworth Smith served with the 25th Battalion and would fight with his battalion at the Battle of Mont Sorel, losing his life on June 10th. Dennis Colburn Draper enlisted on January 6, 1915 in Quebec and served with the 5th Regiment Canadian Mounted Rifles. He would receive a field promotion to Lieutenant Colonel at the 3rd Battle of Ypres after Lieutenant Colonel George Harold Baker was killed. He would later reach the rank of Brigadier General and be put in command of the 8th Canadian Infantry Brigade. He would also receive a Distinguished Service Order for his gallantry at the Battle of Mont Sorel, and he would receive a bar on the medal for his work at Passchendaele. His men spoke highly of him, stating, He was a man who went among his men on the days when ill winds blew. His men also called him a hard-boiled egg, but also said, 
Never a more kindly and sentimental man ever lived. He would survive the war. Private A.Y. Jackson of the 60th Battalion would be wounded on June 3rd, going over the top of the trench. He would later return to the front and become an official Canadian war artist and would paint the haunting canvases of the blasted landscapes of the Western Front. A member of the Group of Seven, he would become one of Canada's most celebrated artists. Captain Percival Molson, the son of John Molson of the Montreal Brewing family and a former Stanley Cup winner in 1897, was wounded in the face at the battle on June 2nd by shrapnel, but refused to leave his troops. In dispatches, it was stated, Although wounded in the head by shrapnel, Captain Molson refused to leave the line and remained with his company throughout the action. He would later return to the front before being killed by a direct hit by a shell in July 1917. He was awarded the Military Cross before his death. For John Maxwell of Orkney, Saskatchewan, he had joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force on September 22, 1915, and found himself serving with the Canadian Mounted Rifles during the battle, where he would be wounded on June 2nd. While in the hospital in England, he would meet Ethel Trower, and they would eventually marry and move to Regina. Sergeant R. McIntyre would be wounded twice in the battle, but would also continue fighting and be mentioned in dispatches for his excellent work and for setting a splendid example. For literally no advancement except preventing the Germans from pushing farther into the Allied area, the Canadian Corps would see 8,430 Canadian soldiers killed, wounded, or missing. The British official history of the war would state the following of the battle. The first Canadian deliberately planned attack in any force had resulted in an unqualified success. Information for this piece comes from Wikipedia, the Canadian Encyclopedia, the Great War Album, CanadianSoldiers.com, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry 1914-1919, the story of the Royal Regina Rifles, Orkney Stories, the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles 1914-1919, and the Royal Highlanders of Canada. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Canadian History X, and if you did, please give a rating and review. Again, you can support the podcast at patreon.com slash CanadaX, and you can email me any questions or ideas you have at CanadianHistoryX at gmail.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.